All right, you sword geeks, let's look at these ninja swords here. These were called, allegedly, ninja to, or ninja ken, or in some cases, shinobi katana. These were allegedly the preferred weapon of the shinobi of feudal Japan. Shinobi means one who steals in, that's what they would have called the ninja back then. Now, it's portrayed by modern practitioners such as Soke Hatsumi, Stephen Hayes, as the weapon of the ninja. And these I found when I started training in the 1980s. These were predominantly featured in popular culture. And this is what attracted me. One of the things to the martial art were these unusual swords here. Now, replicas of swords are supposedly displayed at the Ninja Museum in Igaryu, and that was established in the 1960s. Actually, 1964 was when the Ninja Museum opened, and they supposedly have some replicas of some Chokuto straight blades there. Now, historically, just so you know, there is no physical evidence whatsoever that, that has been found for the existence of this katana-like short sword by the ninja before the 20th century. I think my opinion is, if there's no evidence for it, be skeptical of the history that's written. However, to me, these swords represent my childhood, so they are very real to me. And none of us were alive back then, so no one can know. We know how sketchy history is, because history, as you know, is written by the winners of the battle. And without actual physical evidence, we don't know if these straight swords actually existed. I mean, obviously, this straight blade here look at the culture of Japan, you have like Fudo Myo, the deity king, he carried a straight sword. And obviously there were Chinese swords that were straight. In my opinion, there were straight swords back then, but were they used like in the samurai battles? Nobody knows. If you were carrying one of these around, you would be arrested because it didn't look like the others. So if everyone else had something like this, which is a standard katana, and then you walk down the street with one of these things, which I don't think existed, you would have been arrested. You would, you would want to have a blade like this so you could blend in. That makes more sense. And nobody knows really what happened back then, and there's no great evidence for it, so therefore we should be skeptical that these probably did not exist back then. But they're cool nevertheless, and whether they were designed in the 1400s or the 1955, they're really cool and they bring up parts of my childhood. How I learned about these swords, again, was in the 1980s by Shoko Sugi, which I'll play right now, a couple of clips of him. He was an icon of mine. He was a movie star. All these ninja movies of the 1980s came out and gosh, did I love him. And I wanted that sword and I found it and I saved up the money and I got a job to, to buy one of these swords. Even back then, they were a couple hundred dollars. But I go out in the cornfield and the woods by myself and train for endless hours every single day with my swords. And I'd break them, shatter them, but Shokosugi was awesome. Still alive. I've met him twice, have a couple of his signatures, and these are the swords that he made popular. Now, the first known photograph in my research was in 1956 of the Straight Bladed Ninja Toe, which was featured in a Japanese booklet entitled Ninjutsu, by Okusei. So if you look up 1956 uh, Japanese booklet by Heishichiro, I think his name, Okusei, you, you might find the first pictures of these swords. In 1964, again, the Ninja Museum of the Igo Ryu was opened. And then in 1973, you had the first advertisements in magazines featuring a sword that looked like this with the big square guard, the long handle here, the shorter Saya in Black Belt Magazine. In 1981, books started coming out by Masaki Hatsumi, who's the founder of the Bujin Khan, by my friend Stephen Hayes, who was the first American to study under Hatsumi in 75. So these were published then, and these had swords featured in those books.
and Mr. Hayes goes into some history of those. I don't know if he still agrees with what he wrote back then. I'd have to ask him. And then in 1983, here we come with the Ninja Toe and the movie Revenge of the Ninja. I'll play you a clip here. That was released in theaters in 83. In 84, the first American program on television called The Master, featuring Lee Van Cleef. Lee Van Cleef and Timothy Van Patten had this sword, and that was the first time it was shown on American TV. And to me, that seems like yesterday, because I'm in my 50s now, but back then I was a child, and I mean, you know how time flies, you guys, so it, it seems like yesterday these swords were popular, but that was actually 30 years ago or more, almost 40, so that's a long time ago for you young'uns out there that might not know about the history of these. So for you and me, the recent history of these is very relevant, so I really don't care if they were, there was a ninja sword or if it looked like this back then, who cares? Have fun with life. My life started in 1970, so for me, my history is these, and I love these, and I collect several of them. I have over a hundred swords, but I only have a couple of these because I prefer the katana for its uses. So now I'm gonna get close up with these. We're gonna get close in. I'll show you some of the specs about these particular swords, which you can find right now on eBay. These are not hard to find. Anyone that does a, an hour of Google research can find them. So I'm gonna change this and we'll move in. All right, you having fun so far? Isn't this better than watching Twitch? <laughs> All right, let's go over the, the parts of the sword here. This is the butt cap. It's called the Kashira, which is the pommel at the end. And again, with these ninja swords, it was often, the ones that I've always bought were simple. They didn't care about decorative design or anything like that. This is the ska, which is the handle and the sukaito, which is the wrapping here, which was almost always black as far as I know. This is the, in this case there's no manuki. A manuki, this is the manuki. The manuki is an ornamental thing that goes underneath the wrapping and that just sits against the the ray skin here and there's arguments of what that purpose was for. It's obviously decorative some say that it's a position to where you put your hands, your palms, and some say it raises up the wrapping so it's easy for you to grasp. Some say it has spiritual meaning. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be there. It's a separate, it's a space separator. But for me, uh, I don't really pay much attention to those, but they're in there and you can actually customize those designs. So that's called the Manuki. The Makugi is the peg here. This is what holds the handle onto the blade. So if the tang stops here, you'll have one. If you have a full tang, you might often have a second makugi here. These have to be taken out in order to take the handle off. It's quite a, it's a bit of a process and you often will ruin these as you take them out. So you can buy extra ones online or you could make your own, it's just simple wood. So going back to the ninja sword here, it's a very simple wrap here. The handle of the sky is very straight and in this case it's very long. Let me measure it for you. I'm going to do inches. Sorry about everyone else that uses centimeters. This is about a 12 inch handle which is very long for a sword or in some cases it's about average. So this is a 12 inch handle here. Really good for getting good grip and good balance. This is a very well balanced sword. Moving our way up to the fuchi which is the little sleeve here, this little sleeve part. And then you have the sepa, which are these little collars that hold the sword. It's almost like a washer here, these sepa. It's like a spacer and it keeps the, the guard tight and everything. Opening this up, this is the habaki. Let me get this pen. I got this pen, Masaki Hatsumi gave me this pen when I was at his house. Anyone in the Bujinkan knows if you go to his house that he gives you a pen as a gift in his office. So this is a gift from the Grand Master of Ninjutsu. Writes really well too. I'm just using it to point out here. So this is called the Habaki, which is the, the little blade collar here. Very plain, nothing special. I don't know what that's made of. It might be iron or copper. The Suba, the guard, 
is made of iron very large so that you could hide your hand behind it and as you guys know you don't want your hand to touch the guard so if you're wielding the sword don't put your hand up like that you'll chafe it and you'll ruin your skin there's a reason why this collar is here it's kind of a spacer to make sure your hand is this way and as you know you do not hold a sword this way like a baseball bat it is held diagonally in the hand across the palm this way and this finger rests lightly here the I'm mainly gripping with the two bottom fingers and maybe the middle and the thumb and the index finger are very light here. So you want space. This is the correct way to hold the sword. By doing this, you can get more movement, more rotation in your wrists. If you hold it this way like a baseball bat, your, your bones are not aligned and it's just very unwieldy. And I can tell immediately if someone knows any type of swordsmanship by how they hold that handle. If they hold it diagonally like a golf club, it's correct. If they hold it like this, I know they have no idea what they're talking about. So the correct way to hold the sword is this way in line with the bones. But getting back, people ask, what is this under here? What is that? Is it fake? It's This is a uh, ray skin, the belly of a stingray, or in some cases it's shark skin, and it's got dimples on it so that it holds the sukaito, the wrap, very well. So it's like sandpaper. It's very, very rough inside there. We don't see it often because it's covered, but you can see it here and it's white. Drawing the sword out. We have, let's go over the parts of the saya. The saya is the scabbard, and this is a... Uh, Nothing special here. This is called the Koi Gucci. Koi is a goldfish. Gucci is mouth. So this is the mouth of the goldfish. You can see it looks kind of like a goldfish mouth. The saya itself is just plain. Well, it's not plain. It's a nice lacquered black here. Expect it to get marked up. This is the Kurikata, which is the knob here that holds the, the sageo, which is the cord here. And this you want on the outside of your belt to know that the blade is up. So people ask me, how do you know if the blade is up or down? Well, if this is on your left hip and that, and this is on the outside, which keeps your sword from sliding backwards, you know that the blade is up. If the kurikata is toward you here, then you know the blade is down. And as we know, pirates carry the blades down or the old style of swords. Way back in the 1300s, you might carry the sword with the blade down in your belt, or if you were horseback, you'd have the blade down. And then 16th century, 17th on, as the uh, government changed, the blades were held up, swords were much shorter, and nowadays we carry the swords with the blade up. Blade down, you're a pirate like Johnny Depp, Blade Up is the Samurai Ninja of the modern era, meaning 300 years less. But you might carry the blade down if you're riding a horse. Now this is an interesting Kojiri here. This is the end of the Saya. This one is really cool. And look how they rounded this. So that's got some craftsmanship in it. That one goes to this sword here. This particular one, the sword is actually right to there. So there's no extra space in this one. The kasaki goes right up to the edge. So there's no kojiri on this one here. It's just there's no butt cap at all. So I wouldn't be hitting people with that because you'd break it. Uh, and this saya has about six inches of extra wood there. And according to legend, you could put secret messages down here. You could put metsubushi, blinding powders, chemicals all kinds of different things. Some say there was a hole in the end of this so that you could breathe, like a snorkel underwater. Maybe you could overhear conversations if there was a hole here and you could put this through the hole in the castle wall and you could hear. Maybe it acted like a cone or something where you could hear conversations through the wall if there was a hole and you put your ear at the Koi Gucci end. Who knows, all this stuff is legend and most of it's probably BS and made up but it's fun to imagine them using their weapon with so many different purposes. 
Now, including the habaki, this blade is about 21 inches, 20 and a half to 21 inches. People always ask me, how long is the sword? <laughs> so it's about 21 inches for this one here. This was handmade in China, and this is a good quality sword. Do not be fooled by because it comes to China, that does not mean it's made cheaply. These are good quality swords. And I don't know if you can see the hamon line here, the cloud line. So this is differential tempered here. This is a harder part of the blade, the edge, the ha, which is the blade here. You want that sharp and hard. And then you have the softer metal here. The mune, the back of the blade, is a softer steel. And that's designed specifically that way. So that the blade moves a little bit and it doesn't bend if you hit it. And then the sharp part is the ha up here. As you can see, the cloud line, the hamon line here. This is differential tempered here with clay, probably when they baked the sword. Really cool. This is super sharp. And this is one of the most well-balanced swords that I own of my entire collection. It's perfectly balanced. Most swords are really top-heavy. But this one, because it has a long handle, it has a full tang, so it has a really good balance point, which we know as Kenjutsu practitioners is really good for fighting. So this is a little tanto, a ninja tanto, which matches this sword here underneath. It has a very plain pommel at the end here. Kashira, nothing to speak of, just plain metal or iron. It's got a short handle. In this case, this handle is about six inch little handle here for this dagger. Powerful little weapon. It's got one makugi peg. This one has a manuki decoration here. It's hard to see, it's black. This looks like a little dragon or something. There's the peg. Here's a simple square guard made of iron. I like the scabbard on that. It has this ribbing here. This is beautiful. Very interestingly done. If I open it, draw it out here, as you can see the Hamon line is handmade, highly polished sword. Kasaki's very nasty looking at the end, so that would easily go through a car door. Isn't that beautiful, that edge? This rounded Kasaki here in the Boshi. Hamon line going down. This collar has a little bit of decoration. You see this quite a bit from swords from China. They have that nice little stonework decoration with the sepa there. But this is a nice little tanto dagger, straight chokuto blade, which matches the ninja toe. So this would be, and you've seen these in Shokosugi movies, a little dagger he would keep in his belt. And I've worn this outdoors many times when I'm on training missions at night or just practicing. Beautiful little sword here, a little tanto. We call it a ninja tanto. That wouldn't be incorrect. This Bujin Khan version has a long handle here, which you can find online. These are mm, three, four, five hundred dollars. This one has the iron super guard. It's got the holes in it. If you have a Kozuka knife, it's got a little pattern here. Simple wrap. Drawing this out, again, this is a non-sharp sword. Pretty good quality here. The length of this one, let's see the handle. This handle is almost 14 inches, 13 and a half inch handle. That's really long. The blade is 24 inch blade. Entire length of the sword is about 38 inches. So this is the Bujin Khan, I think it's called Oni Yori. This is a non-sharp version. You can also buy a sharpened version if you want. This is a good sword. I use this in class all the time as a representation of the Shinobi Katana. But we're not sure if it's historically accurate. The length of this Ninja Toe from China is 12 inches as far as the handle. The blade is around 21 inches. Full 
full length of the sword is around 33 inches, give or take an inch. Pretty short for a sword. Faster. Faster than a katana in most cases. So to recap with these beautiful replicas, you have the katana here, standard brown handle katana, good quality, curved sword of the samurai, preferred weapon. Here is a replica of a probably non-existent ninja tanto. Straight chokuto blade, perfectly balanced, sharp as a razor, could easily go through a car door. Beautiful weapon to keep on your obi belt as a secondary or third weapon. You have this Shokosugi version of the Ninja Toe, made popular in the 1980s. You can find these online anywhere from $300 up to $1,200. I've seen them as high as $2,000 if it's a collectible Shokosugi version with all of his little gadgets he had. Here's another one with a different length. Iron Suba, long handle, absolutely stunningly balanced, sharp as you can imagine. Really cool replica. And then you have these curved versions of the ninja sword, which is basically just a shorter katana. You could even use a shoto or a wakizashi. That would be historically accurate. And this one is made for anyone, but made by Bujinkan practitioners. Very nice sword that you can find for about four to five hundred dollars online and these are really nice swords I, I recommend them highly if you can research go to Google go to eBay you can find these wherever you look just take the time be patient because they come and go I checked last week and there were about two of these available but they're gone now so you have to continuously look these are wonderful Memories from my childhood, watching the old 80s cheesy ninja movies on VHS videotape. Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, American Ninja. All of these movies are my history. And in 20, 30, 40 years from now, those of you who are young enough might have your own sword collection that you can share with your children and grandchildren. Just fun. How much fun is this? Just to look at these is really an enjoyable time and to learn how to use them in class tonight to get to a dojo and actually learn how to use these the techniques is a hundred times more fun than just looking at them for now my friends I hope you enjoyed this little video here I hope you weren't too bored with it I love looking at this stuff and we'll make more of these and I would like to do a special video on Shokosugi very soon because he meant a lot to me in my life so I'd like to pay tribute to him for allowing me to continue this ninja legacy into the future with many other of my friends and colleagues. For now on behalf of the dojo enjoy and I hope that you find a collection for yourself and you can find some of these online. We'll see you soon my friends have a great day and thanks for watching.